Welcome to the uh, audio commentary on Lecture 2, Proto-Realists. I've identified two figures here, uh, Rebecca Harding Davis, actually just a little bit, writing a little bit earlier than Whitman's um, Wound Dresser, which is uh, obviously a Civil War piece. But both of these writers are really interesting, I think, for a couple of reasons. You read all through the notes and everything. I'm not going to repeat all the notes and everything of the lecture material, and you've read both works, I'm sure. Um, the thing that I find very interesting about both of these writers is that these were clearly writers who grew up within the Romantic tradition, and you can see it in elements in their writings. You can see it, I got it at the end of the notes and whatnot. There's a, a, a sort of bias towards the emotive in their writing. They're frequently appealing to emotions. Um, there is a latent, if you would, optimism even in dark material like this. The language and the style of writing is very much like uh, the romantic writers of the era. There's a lot of circumlocution, sometimes some might say hyperbole. The, um, the language is not what you and I would consider normal conversational language. Some people might call it gussied up or fancified language, etc. Um, but you know how, if you've read Hawthorne's novels, you know that that's very, very, ro you know, a romantic style of writing. Same thing with James Fenimore Cooper. You know, ordinary, average Joes or Janes just didn't talk like that. And so there's an element of melodrama, all those things that you can see that are still in here, that are still in both of these writings, one's fiction, the other's poetry. But you can see that these are writers that were romantic writers early in their careers, and yet at about mid-century, and particularly with the Civil War, they're beginning to see things differently. The subject matter is changing for them. They're moved to write about something that an earlier generation would have thought was just too gruesome and too dark to deal with. Um, even sexual things for mid-19th mid century Americans were kind of veiled and alluded to. They weren't really talked about much publicly. Uh, the prudishness, if you will, of the, of the Victorian era in America was alive and well. But things like um, the poor, the working classes, alcoholism, um, spousal abuse, uh, those sorts of things, just weren't the topics of fiction very much. Even Dickens kind of handled them with kid gloves. I mean, I mean, it's in there, there's no question, but it's just not dwelt upon because it's just not something that was seen as being the tasteful subject of literature. Similarly, with Whitman, you've got the Civil War, and, you know, in some ways Whitman might have been criticized for this poem having been so graphic because some people might have thought of it as being a morale destroyer and therefore unpatriotic to paint a picture this graphic and vivid and depressing. No, no, poetry in, during wartime should rally the troops. It should be patriotic and optimistic and people should be falling all over themselves to be brave and heroic and whatnot. And Whitman is saying, you know, not all of war is brave or heroic. Sometimes the heroism is where you least expect it. It's in a hospital bed. It's with nurses and people who are tending to the sick, and there are some heroes there too. And so I don't think Whitman is decrying, you know, the futility of war, and, and he's not denouncing war itself. Whitman was not a was not wholly a pacifist in this. When the war broke out, Whitman was a very staunch uh, patriotic believer in the Union cause and idolized Lincoln. He wrote, Oh, Captain, my captain, for example, when Lincoln died. He was utterly devastated by Dink Lincoln's assassination. But his view of war changed because, remember, no one in 1860 had really lived through the horrors of war, if you lived in the United States. I mean, the earliest war prior to that was, well, there was a war in Mexico in the 40s, but it was a very small affair compared to other things. And even the War of 1812 was a relatively quick war that was, you know, felt in only a couple of eastern cities, and that's it. I mean, most Americans in 1861, when the war broke out, had no idea of war. They'd never experienced war. They knew nothing about it, except for what they read. And what they read were highly idealized portraits of bravery and chivalry and romanticism, and here Whitman, a romantic, and he remained a romantic, largely, or associated with the romantic movement his entire career. He wrote Leaves of Grass, which is an incredible incredibly optimistic poem about human nature and human beings and the brotherhood of all people and equality. And he wrote all kinds of treatises, prose as well as poetry, treatises on America and its 
you know, beautiful potential as being this beacon of liberty and freedom to, I mean, he was a, he was a very, very patriotic guy. But having served in a field in 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 the fields hospitals and in the hospitals there in in Washington D.C., he saw the waste of these beautiful young people and their lives. They're just gone, and the sadness of it. There's a dignity to it. There's a sadness to it. There's a graphicness to it. It's almost as though Whitman is saying, "Listen, sometimes war is necessary, and sometimes it brings out great heroism in people, and sometimes it it does." inspire us, but you need to know what you're dealing with. It's almost as though through the wound dresser, Whitman is saying, look, I thought it was a, it was all a bunch of um, marching and pageantry and beautiful uniforms as well, and now I've seen the other side of it, and it's not pretty. So, you know, you need to know both sides of it. The same thing with Rebecca Harding Davis in some respects. It's In, in some ways, you could say that she was a romantic who had cold water splashed in her face in dealing with this question of what do we do with the un, uneducated masses. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really a, a, you can call it a novella if you want to, it's really a short story, but it, it, there is a lot of, a, a lot of undercurrent of, of class violence in this piece. I mean, there is a lot of class violence. Look at the statue itself. Look at the way some of the characters behave. Davis senses an undercurrent of almost barbaric violence that if we don't do something as a civilization to help these people, at least economically, achieve a measure of dignity, that there will be hell to pay for it. And that's very clear. This is about an awakening of individuals who will not be suppressed forever. And what do we do with them is what Harding is basically saying. So both of these writers are writers that, that start off with very idealistic tenets. I, I, don't think, I don't think Davis would have written it, would have written this piece if she didn't think that there was something better for human beings out there than a life of drudgery and depressing poverty uh, and ignorance. I, I think she wrote it for a reason, and the reason is because she wanted people to improve themselves and lift themselves up out of the ditch and out of ignorance and poverty. I think she wanted that. So the idealism of these two romantic figures gets really blended once they get into their subject matter, once they make the observations, once they see reality. They begin to say, you know, it may have been idealism that prompted me to write this, but once I'm in it, I need to tell it like it really is. You could argue that Davis doesn't really get as gritty and realistic as maybe Whitman does, but it's pretty different for its era, and that's the main thing, is that you wouldn't see a Hawthorne, or even a Poe, or even a Melville, write in such gritty, realistic terms. And by realistic, we'll talk about that a little bit. That's in your notes as well, what realism really is. But it's this attempt to depict life as it is, without preconceived agendas, to present people and circumstances and plot lines and and the elements that they have to deal with, the way things really happen, not the way we'd like them to happen, not with a nice bow on it, not with a nice moral tag at the end, and a happy ending, necessarily, but what happens when someone loses control of his or her life? Where do they end up? Sometimes that's not pretty, right? Uh, sometimes a person who starts off doing alcohol and drugs ends up in a pretty dark place and there isn't a happy ending. And so we want the happy ending and we frequently sort of hope for it, but these writers are going to show you the consequences of human behavior and social structures, whether that ends up happy or not. And these two, in an early sort of pre as early precursors of this coming realist movement, are stumbling across something. They're brought to this by their romantic idealism, but once they're encountering the subject matter, they feel compelled to tell it the way they see it, whether that's got a happy ending or not.